Living cells have a similarly versatile energy resource in the molecule, adenosine triphosphate, ATP. ATP can be generated by oxidizing several metabolic fuels, although carbohydrates and fats are especially important. ATP is used in innumerable vital metabolic reactions and physiological functions, not only in humans, but in all forms of life. The primary objective of intermediary metabolism is to maintain a steady supply of ATP so that living cells can grow, reproduce, and respond to the stresses and strains imposed by starvation, exercise, overeating, etc. The nucleotide coenzyme adenosine triphosphate, ATP, is the most important form of chemical energy in all cells. Cleavage of ATP is strongly exergonic. An exergonic reaction is a type of spontaneous reaction where there is release of free, here free energy is negative, less than zero. The energy this provides is used to drive endergonic processes. Now endergonic reactions are the reactions where energy enters the system. The free energy here is positive, such as biosynthesis and movement and transport processes through energetic coupling. The other nucleoside triphosphate coenzymes, GTP, CTP, and UTP, have similar chemical properties to ATP, but they are used for different tasks in metabolism. Let us discuss structure of ATP first. In ATP, a chain of three phosphate residues is linked to the 5-hydroxyl group of the nucleoside adenosine. These phosphate residues are termed alpha, beta, and gamma. The alpha phosphate is bound to ribose by a phosphoric acid ester bond. The linkages between the three phosphate residues, on the other hand, involve much more unstable phosphoric acid anhydride bonds. The active coenzyme is in fact generally a complex of ATP with a magnesium ion, which is coordinatively bound to the alpha and beta phosphates. However, the term ATP is usually used for the sake of simplicity. The ATP molecule has two phosphor anhydride bonds that provide the energy for life. When hydrolyzed at physiological pH, one mole of ATP releases 7.3 kilocalories or 30.66 kilojoules as energy, which can be used for metabolic purposes. These phosphor anhydride bonds are no different from any other covalent bonds. Let us talk about hydrolysis energies now. ATP hydrolysis is the catabolic reaction process by which chemical energy that has been stored in the high energy phosphor anhydride bonds in adenosine triphosphate, ATP, is released after splitting these bonds, for example in muscles, by producing work in the form of mechanical energy. The formula for phosphate residues with single and double bonds is not an accurate representation of the actual charge distribution. In ATP, the oxygen atoms of all three phosphate residues have similarly strong negative charges, while the phosphorus atoms represent centers of positive charge. One of the reasons for the instability of phosphoric anhydride bonds is the repulsion between these negatively charged oxygen atoms, which is partly relieved by cleavage of a phosphate residue. In addition, the free phosphate anion formed by hydrolysis of ATP is better hydrated and more strongly resonance, stabilized in the corresponding residue in ATP. This also contributes to the strongly exergonic character of ATP hydrolysis. In standard conditions, the change in free enthalpy shown as delta G, not that occurs in the hydrolysis of phosphoric acid anhydride bonds amounts to minus 30 to minus 35 kilojoules per mole at pH 7. The anhydride bond of ATP that is cleaved only has a minor influence on. Even the hydrolysis of diphosphate, also known as pyrophosphate, still yields more than minus 30 kilojoules per mole. By contrast, cleavage of the ester bond between ribose and phosphate only provides minus 9 kilojoules per mole. In the cell, the delta G of ATP hydrolysis is substantially larger because the concentrations of ATP ADP and pi are much lower than in standard conditions, and there is an excess of ATP over ADP. The pH value and magnesium ion concentration also affect the value of delta G, the physiological energy yield of ATP hydrolysis to ADP and inorganic phosphate. 
is probably around minus 50 kilojoules per mole. So this was all about the general understanding of ATP. Stick around as we will be discussing biosynthesis of ATP, done anaerobically, next. Hi there! Now before we jump into the video, I have a very important question for you. Have you subscribed to our channel? If not, then subscribe right now to stay updated with the latest and brand new Skadia.com lectures. And click on the bell icon to stay notified about new releases. So, that being said, now that you've subscribed, let's return to the lecture. Let us investigate biosynthesis of ATP now. ATP can be synthesized by phosphorylation of adenosine diphosphate, ADP, by two types of process. One does not need oxygen and is known as substrate-level phosphorylation. The other requires oxygen and is known as oxidative phosphorylation. Quantitatively, the most efficient method for producing ATP is by aerobic metabolism by oxidative phosphorylation. However, ATP can also be produced albeit less efficiently under anaerobic conditions by substrate-level phosphorylation from phosphocreatine and by the adenylate kinase reaction. Although less efficient, the ability to produce ATP without oxygen can be of life-saving importance. Let us ponder upon each one of them. Substrate-level phosphorylation in glycolysis produces ATP. The total number of ATP produced in glycolysis is four from one glucose molecule. Two molecules of ATP are utilized in the first half of glycolysis so there is a net gain of two ATP molecules in glycolysis. The 10 steps that make up glycolysis can be divided into two phases. The first, called the preparatory phase, consists of five steps and starts with the conversion of glucose to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, F1,6-BP, through three enzymatic reactions, namely a phosphorylation at C1, an isomerization and a second phosphorylation, this time at C6, with consumption of two ATP. Fructose 1,6-bisphosphate is then cleaved into two phosphorylated three-carbon compounds, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and dihydroxyacetone phosphate. Finally, the isomerization of DHAP to a second molecule of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate occurs. In the preparatory phase, therefore, a glucose is split into two molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and two ATP are consumed. In the second phase, called the payoff phase, consisting of the remaining five steps of the pathway, the two molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate are converted into two molecules of pyruvate with the concomitant production of 4 ATP so. In this phase, Part of the energy present in the chemical bonds of glucose is extracted and conserved in the form of ATP. Furthermore, reducing equivalents are extracted and conserved in the form of the reduced coenzyme NADH. The metabolic fate of NADH will depend on the cell type anaerobic or anaerobic conditions. ATP is formed by the phosphoglycerate kinase and pyruvate kinase glycolytic reactions. Now every curb cycle produces 2 ATP and 6 NADH for every glucose molecule entering glycolysis. The Krebs cycle takes place inside the mitochondria. The reaction is catalyzed by succinyl coenzyme A synthetase, produces guanosine triphosphate, GTP, which is structurally like ATP, the enzyme nucleoside diphosphate kinase catalyzes the conversion of GTP to ATP in the inner membrane space. Did you know that the inner membrane of the mitochondrion is impermeable to ATP? A protein complex known as the ATP, ADP translocase is needed for the export of ATP in return for the import of ADP and phosphate anion. Now, if we look closely in the next step, Succinyl coenzyme A undergoes an energy-conserving reaction in which succinyl coenzyme A is cleaved to form succinate. This reaction is accompanied by phosphorylation of guanosine diphosphate, GDP, to guanosine triphosphate, GTP. The GTP thus formed then readily transfers its terminal phosphate group to ADP forming an ATP molecule. The reaction is catalyzed by the enzyme Succinyl coenzyme A synthase. 
Now the next one is production of ATP from phosphocreatine. Phosphocreatine is an important emergency reserve of high energy phosphate, which rapidly produces ATP for muscle contraction anaerobically. This can be of life-saving significance, but unfortunately, this supercharges mechanism for ATP production lasts only for a few seconds. During periods of rest, when ATP is abundant, creatine is phosphorylated by creatine kinase to form phosphocreatine. This reaction is especially important in muscles. When a sudden explosive burst of muscle activity occurs, phosphocreatine phosphorylize adenosine diphosphate to generate the ATP needed for muscle contraction. For this reason, phosphocreatine is known as a phosphagent. Some clinical significance is that serum creatine kinase is used to diagnose myocardial infarction and muscle diseases. Creatine is an amino acid, but is not a component of proteins. It is made from arginine and is metabolized to creatinine prior to excretion in the urine. Blood levels of creatinine and the creatinine clearance test are used to evaluate glomerular filtration in renal disease. Ergogenic aids are substances that enhance the speed, power, or stamina of an athlete, many of which are dangerous and illegal. Although controversial, a substantial body of opinion advocates creatine as the only ergogenic aid scientifically proven to enhance performance in both sprint and endurance events. Last one is production of ATP from ADP by adenylate kinase, means myokinase. When ATP has been hydrolyzed to provide energy for muscle contraction, ADP accumulates. Remember that ADP still has a source of untapped energy in the alpha-phosphoanhydride bond. With ingenious biochemical resourcefulness, this energy is salvaged when two molecules of ADP form ATP under anaerobic conditions using the adenylate kinase reaction, previously known as myokinase. So that was all related to ATP and its biosynthesis done anaerobically. Next topic will be biosynthesis done aerobically, so do look out for that. Stay tuned to scotia.com for upcoming biochemistry videos.